Good morning. Welcome to the latest BetaShares Academy webinar. My name is Sarah Hare and I'm delighted today to take you through an introduction to ETPs and some top tips for trading them. As a reminder, everything we talk about today is general in nature. Please look at our website and consider um, financial advice before making any decision. Past performance is not indi indicative of future performance and you can always read the fund documents available on our website. Again, thank you for joining us today. We have a huge number of people uh, joining our very popular BetaShares Academy ETF 101 series. As a reminder, everyone who has registered today will receive a recording of the session and the slides. We'll send these out later today. During the session, please feel free to ask any questions. You can do that by highlighting the question mark tab on the right hand side and just adding your question into the box. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the session. At the moment, and and generally always, <laughs> um, we have a lot of regular content and, and hopefully most of you are familiar with our website and the content we produce in our insights section. The BetaShares team put together a whole range of investment ideas, portfolio construction. Uh, our, our chief economist, David Bassanis, writes a Monday morning quick market outlook. He also uh, contributes to our newsletter and blog on a Wednesday. If you would like to subscribe, please visit our website and, uh, and do so. We have a number of upcoming webinars that you may also be interested to join. The last in our Navigating the Virus Crisis webinar will take place on the 21st, so next week at this time. And we also have a webinar coming up for uh, a, a new fund that we just launched, GGOV, uh, and that's the week after. So if you are interested in any of those webinars, we will provide you with a link in the, in the email that we send out today. But also please head to our website. We do have a page dedicated to webinars, so you can keep up to date and registered on all the events that we will be holding online. Now, I'm pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Alistair Mills. Um, and I couldn't think of anyone better to really take us through the introduction to ETPs and, and really the mechanics of, of how they work and, and provide some top tips for, for thinking about investing in, in, um, in these funds. So without uh, further delay, I will hand over to Alistair to take us through the webinar. Welcome, Alistair. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, look, just as a very quick introduction to BetaShares as a company, for those who don't know as well, BetaShares is an Australian owned and managed fund provider. Our objective is really to provide um, and expand the universe of investment possibilities to investors, particularly with Australian investors in mind. We have the widest range of exchange traded products in Australia um, and manage over 10 and a half billion Australian dollars. All of our funds are traded on the ASX, um, delivering simple access to a broad range of investments, whether it's international, local, fixed income, equities, commodities. Um, and all of our funds are Australian domiciled. Um, so it makes filling out um, foreign tax forms um, much simpler as they're all done at a fund level. Um, for those eagle-eyed viewers, and as Sarah mentioned, we have just launched a brand new fund, the first of its kind in the world actually, an ultra long duration government bond um, across the G7 nations. Um, you can find more information on that fund on our website. The ticker is GGOV. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, we will be doing a webinar specifically on that fund in the coming weeks. Just um, having a look at the growth of the exchange traded product market and ETF market in Australia, um, the growth in Australia has actually surpassed um, the growth rate globally in ETFs and ETPs. Uh, the compound annual growth rate is around 45%. Uh, 
um, you can see in this chart, obviously with recent market movements, the total assets um, has decreased slightly just due to markets. Um, but we have seen a huge amount of interest and gain in popularity um, in ETFs. Um, the market's grown from a base of zero only 19 years ago uh, to over $60 billion in funds under management in April this year. Um, volume itself has seen an enormous spike in the last couple of months and through the crisis. Um, uh, this, this chart speaks for itself, but you can see how that has increased in March and April. Um, investors have flocked to ETFs. They like the liquidity, uh, the transparency and the breadth of uh, exposures on offer um, has meant they've been an extremely well used product throughout this uh, this period and continuing to grow there. Obviously with ETFs becoming extremely popular, um, we want to put on a webinar which the sole purpose really is to give um, you as investors a greater understanding of how they work, how they can be used, how they can be traded um, and with that give you a base knowledge for when you do start investing in them, at least you understand the full mechanics behind them um, and can help you make much better investment decisions knowing what, what it is you're actually buying. What is an exchange traded fund um, or an ETF? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's an exchange traded fund. Um, they are subject to the same rules and regulations as any managed fund as stipulated by ASIC. They really allow investors to access markets which have been traditionally difficult to access, um, whether it was international equities or commodities or fixed income, um, allowing investors to access these at a really low cost. Um, there are more and more coming to market all the time, uh, the wide array of investment products and ideas that you can access and prices are becoming lower and lower um, and they can easily be bought and sold on the exchange there. I suppose the, the key question you'd want to ask yourself is why would why would you use an ETF? Um, how do they compare to other investment vehicles out there? This chart has a table just, just comparing to some of the other um, well-known products out there, including unlisted funds and LICs. The main um, alternatives when investing, I mean, I suppose the simplest and starting point is doing it yourself. Um, so stock picking yourself or you could outsource that to an active manager, both of which you're trying to beat the market, or you could use an index fund, um, whether that's unlisted or in an ETF form, um, so exchange traded, and that's really trying to give market performance in that area. Um, we all know how difficult it is to pick individual stocks. Even the best active managers in the world struggle time after time um, after their typically high fees. Um, so it's good to be able to buy and sell those sort of exposures on the market throughout the trading day, um, knowing exactly what price you can buy and sell at and knowing it's a fair value. So ETFs provide many of the benefits of managed funds and LICs. They're low cost, they trade near fair value and are available to trade throughout the trading day on the ASX. You've heard um, and seen us make reference here to ETPs and ETFs. This really just comes down to naming convention. An ETP is an exchange trading, exchange traded product, and an ETF is a subset of that, an exchange traded fund. Um, there are many different naming conventions, and they're all stipulated by ASIC. If you'd like to know more, um, you can refer to ASIC. But ETF is the simplest version of this and typically a passive um, or index fund. Um, and throughout the presentation, I'll genuinely refer to ETF. Um, but you can see there are all of these different types. So just looking at the, the first kind of those passive and index funds, um, the simplest one on offer and typically the lowest cost. Um, they give broad based diversification to an asset class such as Australian equities um, or bonds, they tend to be fully transparent. Um, so you can see the holdings on a daily basis, um, which are updated on the fund provider's website. Um, and they tend to be quite well diversified and they're trying to give access to the market. Um, on the next slide, you can see, this is a chart comparing, so 
our A200 fund, the Big Shares Australia 200 ETF. Now, this is aiming to track an index which holds the largest 200 companies on the Australian market, um, giving you exposure to that market, not trying to beat it. And for this reason, uh, the fund costs you 0.07% per year in management fees. So the cheapest Australian equities ETF in the world, um, extremely low cost because you're just getting index performance there. The point of this is it's really difficult to beat the market. So there's often a lot of investment merit in just aiming for market performance at a super low cost, at least in, por in portions of your portfolio. Another example of using an index ETF and why you might do that. Here is um, an example of our global cybersecurity ETF. Uh, this one's ticker is HACK, H-A-C-K. So global cybersecurity, a lot of people have been very positive on this thematic. Uh, they think it's a really growing industry along with the technology sector, more money being spent on cybersecurity. So your alternative, you could stock pick in that area. And I think a lot of people um, would go for companies they're most familiar with um, and using day to day. In this case, back then it was Symantec, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. And you can see in this chart to the, towards the left-hand side, Symantec and our global cybersecurities ETF performed reasonably similarly up until the day where a whistleblower for Symantec came out and had suspicions of their dodgy accounting practices at the time. The stock, stock subsequently lost a third of its value in a single day. Um, despite being one of the largest holdings in Hack, uh, the fund dropped an absolute fraction of that amount. And since that day, they've resumed trading at a similar level, albeit with quite a large difference between them. This just goes to highlight, you can get the thematic right. The cybersecurity investment as a thematic has done very well, but if you end up picking the wrong stock um, for unforeseen circumstances, you can get really different outcomes. Um, so diversifying yourself can have some real benefits if you're looking to play these thematics. So there are a couple of examples of just um, pretty simple ETFs. The next in the chain um, are smart beta ETFs. And all smart beta is, is Again, looking to track an index, but that's not based on just weighting companies by their size. So not only giving more money to the larger companies and less to the small, they may weight through a different methodology. Got an example, so potentially weighting by companies with the objective of outperforming, but overweighting more profitable companies. In this case, our uh, quality, our global quality leaders, ETF, QLTY. This looks to hold companies focusing on sustainable return on equity. So companies with financial health in good, good shape, high profitability, high business stability. And the reason for doing that is with the objective of outperformance over the long term. Chart shows um, QLTY's performance in orange uh, compared to that of the broad global market in gray. And you can see over the long term, there's been benefits to holding companies with stable earnings and profitability. But you can still access a product like this for 0.35% per annum. Um, so still very low cost when you're comparing to active managers, but trying to beat a market there. Thirdly, you've got rules-based ETPs. Now, these are Typically funds that don't track an index, um, and as I say, they'll follow a rules-based strategy. Examples are our bear funds that a lot of people are aware of, um, or funds which have a risk management overlay. So there's a bit more to them. Uh, they're still transparent, um, but the, um, the portfolio is not looking to track an index. And then finally, in the newest um, line in the offer, are uh, active ETFs. Um, so you can now access your favorite active managers, um, but they trade on the market just like an ETF. So they trade around fair value, unlike an LIC, um, but you're still getting access to their active strategies. They, um, an example here is uh, uh, with Leg Mason, uh, the Beach Shares Leg Mason Equity Income Fund, EINC. They're, they're looking to access growing and sustainable dividend paying companies and picking the individual stocks which they feel 
will provide the best performance there. Um, so in a recent, with banks cutting their dividends, they're unable to adjust their portfolio um, as accordingly, where they feel the best future returns may lie and enable themselves to grow that income stream. That's an overview of the, the sort of main types of exchange traded product. Um, so there are different ones out there. Usually the names give you a good idea of what's in them, but you can find more information on all of these on our website. Um, so with that knowledge base, I mean, how can you use ETFs um, within your portfolios? The, a very, very common way that they're done is because of their low fees and diversification, you can build a really good core of your portfolio with low cost diversified ETFs, putting large weightings into that core. And then around the sides, you can pick individual stocks. You can use active managers. You can use thematic or sector ETFs. And with that, you've got a good robust portfolio um, with a diversified base, but still you can manage it, personalize it, and look to provide some out, out performance compared to the broader market that way. And you can be as dynamic as you want with this. So for the interesting bit, um, how do you actually start buying and selling uh, exchange traded products? It's actually extremely simple. Um, you know, we always say that it's always important to speak to a financial advisor and they can do all of this to you and provide you with some proper um, investment advice, but if you're looking to do portions yourself, all you really need is a brokerage account and you're ready to trade. Um, you can do so with a very low um, investment amount, um, that's typically up to your brokerage account, but many of them start just with $500. And from there, you can just buy fund units um, using the fund's ticket code. So whether it was A200, or QLTY, or HACK, each fund has its own ticket code. And the minimum investment increment is one unit. Um, this unit price will vary from fund to fund. Just because one has a higher unit value than the other doesn't mean it's necessarily more expensive. Um, $1,000 in one fund will get you $1,000 of exposure, whether the unit price is $100 or $10. You would just own a different number of units. So if a fund had a unit price of $10 and you wanted a thousand dollars of exposure, you would just need to buy 100 units. Before trading, um, it's really worth understanding the structure and the mechanics of how an ETF is brought to market. Um, so just like managed funds, they trade on market, um, but unlike LICs, they trade around fair value. And how this occurs is down to three layers of liquidity. The first, which you can see at the bottom, um, this is known as the primary market, but just like an unlisted managed fund, ETFs tend to hold their underlying stocks or bond and, and can grow and shrink in terms of the number of units that are available. An authorized participant is an institution like an investment bank, and they have a special license to create and redeem units directly with the ETF manager, like beta shares. So just like you could buy and sell an unlisted fund, they can do that with an ETF. Then those units are brought to market and traded on the ASX by market makers. Again, these are financial institutions, and this is layer two in that triangle. Their sole job really is to provide liquidity on the exchange of fund units. Uh, they'll sit with inventory, uh, providing volume on both the sell side and the buy side, so the bid and the offer, with a spread either side of fair value. So most of the time when you're buying and selling ETFs, uh, you're, you're transacting with a market maker. And finally, at the, the tip of the point, there is the final le level of liquidity, which is known as natural volume. So this is other buyers and sellers like yourself who, just like with a stock, can buy and sell from each other if their prices match up um, inside the prices quoted by the market makers. So if ETFs can trade just like individual stocks, the difference is those two extra layers of liquidity at the bottom. Even if there are no individual investors who want to buy your ETF units, if you were trying to sell a fund, you can rest assured that most of the time there will be a market maker to buy them off you and vice versa. If there's lots of demand for a fund and the market maker sells all of their inventory, 
an authorized participant goes and creates more fund units and the fund grows um, in return for them giving us cash or giving us the underlying holdings um, and vice versa. If there's a lot of selling, they can give the fund units to us and we'll give them cash or the underlying holdings. And this is what makes ETFs known as open-ended. Um, this open-ended mechanism is what keeps an ETF trading at fair value. Unlike an LIC, which is a closed-ended security, an ETF is open-ended. And if an ETF is trading at a discount, they, um, an authorized participant can buy cheap ETF units and sell the underlying holdings, and they'll trade around fair value. And we'll always say an ETF is as liquid as its underlying holdings. Even if you don't see many individual buyers and sellers, we have a capital markets team. If you ever need more volume on the screen, you can call me to shares directly um, and market makers will be there to increase their volume for you. So as long as the underlying exposure you're investing in is liquid and trading, an ETF will be trading with fair spreads typically. And just on that note of fair value, um, what is the fair value of an ETF? If the fund uh, unit price is $10, but all of the stocks within the fund have pr higher prices than that, how does, how does that work? Um, again, it's very similar to an, uh, an unlisted managed fund. Um, ETF has a net asset value. This is calculated at the end of the day, but really all a net asset value or NAV is, is adding up all the assets in the fund minus the liabilities, and then just dividing this by the number of units on offer. So, for example, if a fund had a million dollars in it and there were 100,000 units on the market, then the NAV per unit is $10. And this will move accordingly as those underlying holdings move each day. So the NAV is calculated at the end of the day um, by an independent administrator as a check. Um, but the fact that an ETF trades throughout the day, um, how does the unit price move between 10 o'clock and four o'clock and how do you know that that is fair? Well, during the day, an ETF will have what's known as an indicative net asset value or an INAV. And this is just based again, just like the NAV, but whilst the securities are trading, um, looking at the price of those and giving an indicated fair value throughout that day. This is updated every 15 seconds and for our Australian equity ETFs, you can see uh, what the INAV is for those. So for an ETF that's holding Australian equities, this is very simple because all of the underlying securities are trading, you know what their prices are throughout the day, and you can therefore give a, an INAV throughout the day. But for an international ETF where the underlying might not be trading, so for example, our NASDAQ 100, uh, which is a US equities exposure, everyone in the US is asleep when NDQ is trading in the Australian market, how does that have a fair value during our market? This is down to futures. So the market makers will use a proxy and it's typically futures contracts, which, um, so NASDAQ 100 futures in this case, and this will give us a fair, a fair value representation during our market because futures contracts trade 23 hours a day. So it's typically futures which determine how a market opens compared to yesterday's close. You'll notice the Australian market doesn't open this morning at the same price as it closes yesterday every day. This is typically defined by how the futures have moved as those international investors are trading futures whilst we're all asleep. The same is true internationally and that is how you can price and give a fair INAV of an international ETF throughout our trading day. So, as long as the futures are trading or as long as the underlying holdings are trading, you can get a real good fair value estimate there and know that an ETF is trading where it should be. And this is what determines how an ETF's price moves throughout our trading day. With that in mind, um, and best practice when it comes to trading ETFs, the first and absolute golden rule is using limit orders when you are investing. A limit order enables you to set the price which you're willing to buy and sell at. It doesn't just take out all orders on the market and you know that you're getting a price which you think is fair. Secondly, it's really important um, 
we recommend avoid trading in the match. The match is the opening auction, so between 10 and 10.10 10, 10, um, there and 4 and 4.10. Um, and this is where not all of the stocks are open um, yet. So if not all of the stocks in your ETF are trading, it's very difficult to price the ETF at that point. So if you can avoid these periods, because the ETF will still be trading through that period, but if you can avoid trading through that period, you know you're getting a fairer price typically. And then for international ETFs, just like the NASDAQ one, make sure the underlying futures are trading. Um, and that will enable you to be sure that the ETF can be priced uh, fairly. So during the crisis, we saw futures markets hit stop losses um, or circuit breakers, sorry, and that stops the futures trading and therefore it's difficult to price the ETF. So if the underlying exposure or proxy is trading, you can, you can be sure that your ETF is being traded fairly. For those INAVs, um, they're available on our website or through a ticket code, um, which you can use through your broker account. If you go to each of the individual fund pages on our website, and in the key facts area near the, near the top, you will see an INAV figure, or it will give you a, a ticket code, and then you can put that into your trading account, and that will give you the updated um, fair value. With that, I think there's a lot of information to digest there, so we don't want to take, you know, be speaking for ages and ages on this. I think the key points are there. With that, keeping it in mind and keep bearing in the, the usual regulatory information, there's risk in all of these investments. Um, even with this, this knowledge, there's always market risk um, and various other risks. It's really important to read the product disclosure statement of any product that you're investing in and getting an understanding of what is the underlying exposure. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. Um, and there's no guarantee um, there with those returns. And this is all being general advice in nature. Um, with that, I'm see there's um, a lot of questions out there. Um, so there's a good opportunity to answer as many of those as we can. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Alistair. That was great. Um, a really good sort of brief introduction and overview and some good top tips there. A lot of people have actually asked about the INAB and I know Alistair did explain it, but on the fund page in the key facts section, there is a pricing information table and that holds the uh, the information uh, delayed by 20 minutes from the ASX. So um, if you want to visit our website, you can certainly see um, that, that information there. So I'll take the first question, please, Alistair. Um, and, and if you could please answer who sets or who is responsible for calculating the NAV and INAV? Yes, absolutely. So the INAV and NAV is done by multiple sources. So at the end of the day, we will calculate what we think is the NAV, and then this is sent off to a third party administrator. So it has to be checked by multiple sources and they have to agree. So you know that we're not just making up what we think is fair value. It's checked by multiple sources and you can see the fund administrator for each fund in the PDS. Um, so you know who is doing that. Um, and INAV is typically done, um, again, by an independent source, but the market makers will also be constantly uh, calculating what they feel is their INAV as well, because they're holding the underlying securities and putting them on market. They need to be doing so around what they think is fair value. And typically these will be very similar, um, but that, that's how those are, are displayed and calculated. Um, Alistair, there's a couple of questions here about limit orders, uh, stop loss. So could you please just perhaps just go through the, the use of, of limit orders again um, and why you, you, you would um, say to, to implement this? Yes, absolutely. So really when it comes to trading, and this is true of stocks and, and anything on the market with your brokerage account, is you, you tend to have two options and you can either do a market order and you'll put in that you want to buy or sell a thousand dollars worth of something um, and that'll just take or a set number of units or something and that will just take out the top prices um, on the other side for you like blindly um, from what 
um, whatever price you think is fair. It's just going to take out the best ones. Now, the problem with that is during not normal market conditions, I mean, that, that can be fine. But if for some reason um, there's a, a break in trading or things aren't trading at fair value for a split second, if you're just blindly taking out those top orders, then you might not get what is a rational fair price. So a limit order enables you to look at what is the bid and the offer, what is the INAB, what do you think is fair value, and put in a price which you think is fair. That could be slightly higher than the best bid or it could be equal to the best offer. Whatever you think and whatever price you want to buy and sell at, it gives you complete control knowing that your trade is not going to be executed unless it's at the value that you think is fair. So it just takes away some risk um, that if markets have suddenly uh, moved irrationally, that you're going to get filled at a bad price. Um, you, you look, you make a rational decision as to what fair value is on that ETF, put in your price, and if it gets filled, it gets filled. If it doesn't, then you can adjust your price accordingly if you think that's, that's suitable. Thanks, Alistair. Um, a question here on authorised participant and the, and the difference between an authorised participant and market maker and where we actually find or where an investor could find out who the market maker is. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's a good question. Now, an authorised participant is just that. So it's an authorised participant is able to create and redeem um, units directly in the fund. A market maker is a liquidity provider, and often they are one and the same. So the majority of market makers have an authorized participant agreement, but not all authorized participants are market makers. Um, so the market makers are available to be viewed, and they're all on our website. So each fund page will show in the key facts again who the market makers are. Um, but all an authorised participant is, is someone who has an agreement to create and redeem with us. A market maker is a special liquidity provider there. Often the same thing, so Deutsche Bank and Susquehanna um, do both for us on a lot of our funds, um, but then there are other independent authorised participants who don't make markets for us. They're just naming te uh, terminologies for different, different jobs from different service providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and absolutely, that information is available in the key facts trading information section on each individual fund page. Another question here, Alistair, about when uh, when we buy a certain amount of A200, for example, which is our Australia 200 ETF, there will be 200 company stocks of that value that are held in the underlying. Is that is that the correct understanding of that? It's it's almost it's almost right. Now, if you had two hundred dollars and you wanted to go out and buy all two hundred companies in that index, you might struggle because individual unit prices of some of those stocks may be higher than two hundred dollars, or at least if you've got two hundred dollars, not every stock is worth one dollar. So when the fund is launched, we may start with say we start with a million dollars. And the fund uses that million dollars and buys all 200 stocks. And then those units go to market. So the inventory is already held by the market makers. And each fund unit can start at any, any notional value, really. Like each fund unit could have a starting value of $10. Like I mentioned, if we had that million dollars worth of the 200 stocks in total and brought to market 100,000 units each unit is ten dollars despite some of the individual stocks might have a trading value of over a hundred dollars so your two hundred dollars you would just invest your two hundred dollars and you'd hold 20 units um, but you wouldn't be able to use two hundred dollars and buy all 200 there you'd just be able to buy two hundred dollars of the fund because the fund units are actually out there holding the individual stocks and just dividing that by a number to give the, the fund value at the first creation date, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just a, a question from George on a specific uh, fund. This is QLTY, um, and, and you referenced it at the start of the webinar when you spoke about Smart Beta. If 
funds. If actively managed funds underperform a relevant index some of the time, uh, then isn't quality an actively managed ETF? So who selects these quality companies? So I think the question really is about um, how, how a company is defined as, as quality and how that's actually set. Absolutely, and that, that's a good question. Um, typically, an active manager is, it may have a benchmark. So in this case, it was the MSCI world that we were looking at. So they could be a global fund manager looking to pick what they think are the best stocks um, in, the, um, in the global market. The difference between that and a smart beta ETF is, so QLTY, the index provider, is iStocks. Um, they're, they're the index provider. They're the ones just using financial metrics to weight these companies. So it's a systematic process and it is just looking at the financial metrics and weighting them accordingly as opposed to taking a view that Apple is better than Microsoft in that area or PayPal is better than um, MasterCard. They may all be included but it is just purely a passive weighting strategy um, and looking at which is the most profitable, which has had the bit most uh, business stability, um, the lowest debt, and assigning a scoring system and just weighting it that way, as opposed to doing underlying research with each of the companies and going to speak to their management. So it's done by the index provider much more systematically, and we're just trying to track that index. That's why the fees are so cheap. That's why QLTY costs you 35 basis points, 0.35%, where an active manager is going out there and spending a lot of time trying to pick the best stocks um, and charging very high fees for it, typically. Um, so it's just looking at, and a lot of what an active manager does will be captured by QLTY from a top-down perspective, but you just don't get that same individual stock picking um, and so-called investment expertise of an individual manager um, and analysts going in there. It is done by a systematic process, just by a scoring system or just by a weighting system. So it's passive in nature as opposed to active. Mm -hmm. um, Alastair, can you please explain international ETFs and uh, why, why we have hedged or unhedged? Yes. Um, Really, the, he the hedging is down to currency. Um, so if the, the easiest way to think of it is if you were buying an individual stock. So as an Australian investor, if you bought one share of Apple stock, even if the share price of Apple did not move, but the US dollar increased, your investment from Australian dollars into that Apple share will have gone up in value because the US dollar value would have increased and therefore, if you went to sell Apple and you'd have to do that in US dollars, your investment has gone up. So a strengthening US dollar for an unhedged exposure to Apple shares or any US exposure, so any US ETF like the NASDAQ, if you're unhedged and the US dollar goes up or the Australian dollar goes down versus the US dollar, that is good for your investment. So, And the opposite is true. So if you're unhedged, as an in, as a Australian investor investing in international markets, you carry currency risk because the value of your investment will change if the currency moves. So some investments are currency hedged. And on top of that underlying exposure, they will use a system to try and remove that currency exposure. So they will go short the uh, foreign currency and long Australian dollars. But this looks to mitigate that currency exposure. Now, whether you go for a hedged exposure or an unhedged exposure can be down for a number of reasons. And often there are alternatives that you can pick and choose between. Some people do it because of their view on the, that foreign currency or the local one. But some markets have um, shown to be historically benefiting from not having the currency exposure. And what we've seen recently, for instance, is, is gold. Um, gold is priced in US dollars. Um, but recently, the US dollar, and over the long term, when gold has been rallying, the US dollar versus the Aussie has come off. So the Aussie has strengthened. So if you're unhedged, that US dollar weakening has been bad for your investment. So an, a hedged exposure over the long term of rising gold prices has benefited you. So really, it comes down to the underlying exposure 
what your views are on the currency, whether it's at this point in time or over the long term. And there is often merit for using a blend between hedged and unhedged exposures. Thank you. Um, Alistair, are ETFs suitable for buying and holding long term? I love this question. Absolutely. Um, just because you can buy and sell an ETF throughout the day, um, and minute by minute, does not necessarily mean they're just a trading vehicle. Really, the benefits of being able to do that are you've got instant liquidity, T plus two, um, who in two days that cash is going to settle into your account, but it gives you flexibility. Um, if you want to hold an ETF for 10, 20, 30 years, there's nothing stopping you doing that just because it's listed on the ASX. Um, so don't necessarily think just because these things can be traded, they have to be so. Um, you can hold them just like you would an unlisted fund. Um, really, it's up to individuals to make the decision on how they want to structure their portfolio, but they can be really, really good long-term investment vehicles. Um, Alistair, a question here on bond ETFs, uh, and we did mention that we have just launched a, a new bond ETF. So for bond ETFs, does the ETF hold all the bonds to maturity? Now, this, this really depends on the underlying index. Um, a lot of bond um, indices will, and they'll hold them right down to um, maturity in line with the index. And you can see this typically if the index uh, says zero plus, in it, that means that it holds to maturity. Um, for beta shares, we've actually tended to avoid doing this. Um, we feel there are, there are benefits to investors by not holding to maturity because as a bond approaches maturity, it returns to its fair value. If you can sell before that, there's um, often known what is called roll yield, um, and it's a capital gain as a bond comes in to uh, from its maturity because a five-year bond has a higher risk, particularly in credit markets, a five-year bond has a higher risk of defaulting than a four-year bond, for instance. So if you buy a five-year bond and sell after a year, um, that yield will have come down and the price may have come out if the yield curve is upward sloping. Um, I imagine we'll cover this in more depth in the fixed income webinar. Um, it's something you can talk about for quite a long time, but really it's down to the index and the index will tell you whether they um, they hold them to maturity or not. Most of these bond ETFs are aiming to replicate an index. Thanks, Alistair. Um, a question on regular dividends for ETFs. So um, do they pay them? Uh, yes, and again, on the, uh, on the website and the key facts, you'll be able to see um, the distribution timetable of these ETFs. Um, not all of them pay at the same time. Some pay monthly, others quarterly, others on an annual basis, but they do pay them and they do pay franking credits if they are um, valid. So Australian equity ETFs or hybrids, um, they'll pay franking credits. Um, ETFs are structured just like managed funds. So they have to pay out the distributions received net of fees and expenses, and they have to pay out the capital gains um, if they're not offset within the fund. Um, so you will get the distributions um, and the dividends received by the fund and you will go get those associated franking credits, typically. Um, and just, we've got time for a couple more, I think. So the difference between an exchange traded fund, ETF, and an exchange traded option, ETO. Yeah, so they're, they're very different um, in nature. It, it's, um, one is a derivative product um, and just because it trades on the exchange and that's an ETO. Um, so options are just exchange traded derivatives. Um, an ETF is an exchange traded fund. It's a unit trust. Um, all the, it's it's an investment pool structure. All the assets are held within a ring fence segregated account with a third party custodian. So just like a managed fund. Um, yeah, don't get confused just because they're both um, exchange traded and start with ETF, they are um, nothing alike in that regard. Um, is there a limit on how much you can invest into an ETF? Uh, no, you can put as much as, as you want, as long as there's liquidity in the underlying, and ETFs tend to track very liquid exposures. Um, so if you were looking to invest in 
US large caps, you could put a lot more money in than if you were going to invest in um, Russian small caps, for instance. Um, so ETFs are as liquid as the underlying, and with that, I'm talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so if you've, if you've got that, don't worry. Um, but you can also put in as little as you want. Um, so each fund, um, some funds have unit prices of $3, others $5, others over $100. Um, and you can just buy increments of one unit. So um, typically your minimum investment amount comes down to what your broker will allow. Um, so I'd start looking there and then you can just buy as many units as you want or as few as you want. Thank you, Alistair. We've had so many questions today um, and unfortunately we haven't been able to get to them all, but I, I will just remind everyone that we are sending a copy of the slides today and a recording of the session that will be in your inbox later this afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Again, we've had such a, a huge response and so many of you joining us to hear Alistair share his expertise uh, and, and top tips. So I hope you've found it educational. I hope you'll join us again. Uh, and I, I really thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sarah.